Good evening, everyone. It's always nice, isn't it, to receive an invitation to something, uh, perhaps an invitation to a party or a wedding or some other event. Uh, there's always great joy associated with such things. And the Bible lays out for us an invitation from God himself. It tells us about his purpose and a plan that he has, and he's interested in us, in you and in me. He's, he's enabled us in our long and far off time from the time when the Bible was written. He's enabled us to speak a totally different language. We live in a totally different part of the world at a totally different time from the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he's allowed you and me to know of it. And that's really worth thinking about to start with. <coughs> and what we want to do tonight is to think about that invitation that God has given to us and think about it in the context of our lives. I want to start with our lives right now and our daily concerns and then I want to think about the coming of Christ and what that means for us. So to start with, before we think about the invitation proper, let's just start with where we are. You see, it's a fact of our lives and of our existence that there are experiences that we enjoy. There are times which are fun and enjoyable. And, well, if we're honest, if anything like me, we'd like things to be like that always, really. And the times when, when whatever it is we like to do or the people we like to be with, that it's always like that. And there are times when life is easy and it's good. And then there are other times when, when it's not quite always like that. And things are more difficult for us. Just worth saying, and I shall qualify this in a moment, but somebody put together, and I don't know, I must confess what the basis for this uh, summary is, but 30% of our worries have already happened, 12% are needless imaginings, 10% are little things about what other people think, which leaves 8% for legitimate concerns, so it is said, and that those are related very often to things about which we do have control. But that still leaves, even if that's right. And you may, you may perhaps recognise there is some truth in that, but that's not to explain away, is it, the things that we do find difficult and we do worry about. And those might be things that we're dealing with now, or there might be things in the future which are unknown. Now, you may, if you were here a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I put out a few bits of paper with some very tiny writing on, for which apologies, and I asked you to, to give me your suggestions of things you were worried about. And some of you have very kindly completed an anonymous survey, and I'm just going to go through some of the findings of that. that because this is what people said, well, now this is what they're worried about, or what they're thinking about, or concerned about, okay? So, you know, perhaps... A, you know, will I find someone to marry? What work will I do? There are all kinds of choices and questions that face us as, as we go through life. Will we have enough to eat? Will we have enough money? What about the world we live in? Are we going to be, you know, the subject of some of the terrible wars and violence that there is in the earth? Am I going to be enabled to look after my family? This was quite a full answer, this one, that took into account all kinds of things, both materially and spiritually and in all kinds of ways. And perhaps as time goes on, am I going to be able to look after myself? So there's, there's all kinds of challenges that face us, or that we can recognise are of concern to us. And the good news is that if those things haven't yet come to us, then perhaps they will at some time in the near future. And so it's a reality, isn't it, of our lives. But then that's not the only thing, is it? Of all of those things that we experience, we know that we're nothing to change. There is an end result, that life, human life, naturally speaking, is tending in one direction. And it's not an enticing prospect for any of us. Equally, if we look a little more widely and think about, well, if we're already following in the ways of God, or if we have a concern about that, then perhaps there's all kinds of concerns we might have about our own family and the direction of our lives and that of our family. Um, we, we might, I think I've just repeated that one, haven't I? Uh, we might be concerned about, about the nature of the message that we're following or, or we might be misled by. Um, 
you know, there are all kinds of concerns, aren't there, as we think spiritually, if those things are important to us. And again, the reality of the temporary nature of our life and of our existence is that that which we have today, were nothing to change, could not be guaranteed that it's always going to be here. And beyond all of that, we might sometimes wonder, well, when the Lord comes, if we understand, and I'm taking that as read this evening, that the Bible teaches the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes, how will I feel? Am I concerned that I won't come up to the mark? There's his expectation of me. Perhaps I'm not living in the right way now. Perhaps I have fear. And if I have fear, then my love isn't perfect. And does that mean my faith isn't adequate? So th these, are, these are real concerns. And then the, the worst of all, perhaps, that when the Lord comes, he won't accept us. So these are real things for us. And if we're concerned about the coming of Christ and the kind of change that the Bible speaks of, it, it's important that we address them, isn't it, in our lives? Not, not that we should... The Bible is not given to us that we might turn away in a paroxysm of fear and give up. It really isn't. The message of the Bible is that God has given his Son that we might come to the Father through him. But it's natural that we should have these sort of concerns. What, what sort of thing is going to happen in the future? If, if I'm going to be persecuted for my faith, will, will I stand up to it? And the biggest concern of all, am I going to lead myself in the wrong direction, away from the ways of God? Well, just two things before we get started, really, then. Because the message, it seems to me, from all of this is, the Bible is calling out to us to trust in God. It's natural to us to, to have that range of concerns. All human life is here, right? All the things that everybody would be concerned about, and we add to them the fact that if we're trying conscientiously or we have an interest in the things of God, well, then there's another area there. And it's natural that we should feel those things. But God is saying, what he really would have said to Adam and Eve. Just think of Adam and Eve when they first walked out of the garden. They'd been in a perfect world, in a perfect relationship with themselves and with their creator. And there would have been a day, wouldn't there, when Adam, for the first time, as he was doing his cultivation, when he pricked his hand on a thistle. There must have been a first day, mustn't there? And as that shooting pain ran through, you know, I know a lot about uh, gardening of thistles, as you understand. <laughs> well, that, the first time that shooting pain went up his arm and he thought, ow, oh, what was that? He'd been drawn back to the fact that now he was living in a less than ideal state and he was totally dependent upon his creator, both for his life now and for a future life that God had promised to him. So from the moment that he went out in the sweat of his face to earn his bread, he would be reminded he was dependent upon his creator. And likewise Eve, when those labour pains came on her, think of being the very first woman to give birth. I mean, for every woman, surely, who gives birth the first time is, is at any time, is an amazing ordeal in many ways. But just imagine being Eve and nobody before you has ever given birth. And how those angelic handmaids, uh, um, midwives, uh, must have been around to support and to help. And how she would, as those pains came upon her, be called back to her dependence on her creator. So our difficulties, the Lord knows. And he is calling to us to trust in him. And they won't all be resolved, will they? This side of the kingdom. They may be for us. They may be for us to help others now. For if we have been through an experience, we're a better placed to help others. And they may be for another reason that I'll come on to later. Just bear that in mind. So we can't get through life without God. And the second reason is, whatever the trouble is, God is there first. There's the cloud leading the people of Israel through the wilderness to get 
to Israel. And ahead of them went the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of smoke by night that demonstrated to them that the Almighty was searching out a place for them. It, it, it's, that principle is shown most powerfully in Joseph, who went down to Egypt to preserve life, we read. I, I remember many years ago when I was learning to drive and, well, I wasn't perhaps the quickest on the uptake. I, there was a collision. And I remember sitting on a bench afterwards. Um, you can imagine how I felt. But I did think, well, this is extraordinary, isn't it? The Lord knew that that was going to happen. He allowed it to happen, obviously. I mean, it was a small thing. There was, no, there was no harm done. But there it is. The Lord knows before we encounter a difficulty. The Lord is there. And if we trust him, difficult as those circumstances are, he will be with us in it. You see, the whole principle of the Bible is God is not leaving us on our own. All of this purpose that he's unveiled is for his purpose, ultimately, <coughs> as well as our benefit. Let's go to that chapter that we read together. And let's think about that bigger purpose. Now, Matthew 22, in those verses that we read together, contains the record of a parable that the Lord Jesus Christ told. And I'm not going to go through all the parable in huge detail, but just to pick out the key points here. You read in Matthew 22, verse 2, that the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And there he prepares it. He gets all the food ready. He invites all the people. That's verse 3 and 4. But all the people who are invited in verse 5, they made light of it and they went their ways and said, oh, we can't come to the wedding. We're too busy. We can't possibly come. You can just imagine how the person who's organising the wedding would feel if that happened. And then even worse, um, verse 6, the rest of them um, took his servants and even killed them. Now, in the parable, this is talking about God's invitation to the nation of the, of the Jews, Israel. This is your opportunity, he said to them. I'm giving you the privileged position in my kingdom. And they didn't want to know about it. In the end, they were going to kill the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The chief rulers, the Sanhedrin, the priestly party, Caiaphas and Annas, the high priest, they, between them, arranged for the death of Christ. And the consequence was that Jerusalem, verse 7, was burned up. And so then the call went out more widely, didn't it? And to everybody that said, well, now anybody, you come in, verse um, 9, go therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage, invite, call to the marriage. And that's really why you and I, in this far-off land, have an opportunity that God in his purpose allowed those who were not of the Jewish nation to come into the things of the kingdom and the things of the name. And then, verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how that camest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now, it seems there is the suggestion here that this man knew he should have had on a wedding garment. It wasn't a total surprise to him. I think there's something in, in the text I won't go into now that, that suggests that. But the point is this. The garment is what we're familiar with from the principle of Galatians chapter 3. As many as us have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. That's the language of the garment, isn't it? And here was the man invited to the wedding here's the lord jesus christ and he's inviting him to this important event but he says well you've got to be in christ and you've got to have put on christ that's the principle isn't it and really if you boil everything down to its simplest that's really what it is there is there is no hope says the bible outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no name given under heaven whereby we must be saved except through him. There could be all kinds of ways that we could think about that we might come up with, but that's what the Bible says. 
And you see how he ends the story in verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. Or really, many are invited, but few are chosen. That's really the sense of the word. Now, who, this thing about being chosen then, who was chosen initially? And who wasn't chosen? And why not? Well, the whole of the Jewish nation was chosen. And, and at least they were invited, weren't they? But they chose not in that sense. They didn't respond, did they, to that invitation? And then along came the man who ended up there in the wedding. He'd been invited and he walked in. But at the critical point, he was not wearing the garment. And it seems to me he's in some way not in Christ. And that might have meant that he wasn't baptised, I think, in the parable. It might have meant that in some way the garment didn't mean he was in Christ. Perhaps, perhaps his life was not really directed in the ways of God. So to be in Christ then is about the whole of our life and our direction being towards him. Now, I want to come back to that point in a moment. So what, what's really the point here? Where, where is the event that he's talking about when he says in verse 13, they said to the servants, take him away. What, what's this referring to? You see, there is in the New Testament the concept of when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, it's going to be the judgment. And any time anybody says to you, well, there's going to be a judgment, I mean, it's, it's not the most enticing idea, is it? It's a bit, well, you know, we, at work we have people called auditors, and they come round and they look over your shoulder and they say, what are you doing and how are you doing it? And nobody much likes the idea of that being done. And, it, and is that what it's about, that the Lord is going to look in minute detail and say, well, what did you do on that date? And was it the right thing? I, I prefer to think of it rather as an invitation to a wedding. That the Lord Jesus Christ is the heavenly bridegroom and he's looking for his bride. And the invitation is to us to be that bride. And the bride, if you think about a marriage and a bride and a groom, of how gradually their lives become entwined and their thinking has to come together. For a marriage is, if it is anything, a marriage of true minds, isn't it? To start with, that it might be reflected in every other area of life. Now, here's the question then. When the Lord comes and he's looking for his bride, which... In the Bible language is his people made up from all nations and from all generations of people. Is he going to find us looking for him? Is, is him and his ways going to be at the centre of our lives? Just think about how it's expressed in Revelation 19. Verse 5 there in Revelation 19. And this is in the kingdom age. Okay, We're being taken forward into the kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, so many people. And this is what they say in verse 11, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now ultimately it's clear from the Bible that none of us could appear before the Lord Jesus Christ and say, well, I'm righteous, I've done this and I've done that and you owe me eternal life. That could never be right. The righteousness that the whole promise of the scriptures is that God will give us the righteousness of the Lord Jesus, his perfect overcoming of sin. 
And that's the picture here, isn't it? Here's the white robe of righteousness that's being given to the bride in verse 8. But there's something else, because the bride hasn't just turned up there in verse 8. She didn't just suddenly rock up there and then the Lord said, oh, nice to see you. Just put this robe on. Look at verse 7. End of the verse, for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has prepared herself. So the bride is being called now, because now is the time before the Lord comes, the bride is being called to get ready like any bride would. And the picture is this, isn't it? That God counts us as righteous because of our faith and our belief. He forgives our sin if we come to him in his ways and seek his mercies. If we're baptised into him, he can wipe out anything that is against us. And if we continue in him and seek his mercy and his forgiveness, then we can be found in him in that day. So that faith, that demonstration of our belief in what Jesus had said, needs to be shown by how we live. It's described in James as works being made perfect or being made complete and that I think is the bride getting ready living a life desiring to live a life which is right with God recognizing where she fails seeking God's mercy through the Lord Jesus and then in that day when the Lord comes giving us the righteousness of God absolutely the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus so I now want you to just imagine I want you to take what we've spoken about into the future because there will come a day, won't there, when the Lord comes and there will be a knock at the door. I don't know how that we'll hear that voice, but I'm sure we will know it. And whether it is an angel or in some other way, the day will come when we know the Lord is here and we are called to him. And everything that we know now that is normal and mundane and ordinary, and all the things that fill our minds from day to day, suddenly are broken into. The Master is come and calls for you. And the Bible speaks that just like we found Peter being carried from one place to another, so might we too. I, I, I mean Philip, sorry. From one place to another. And just imagine now, that you can eavesdrop then on what's happening. For we read that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. However precisely that works, and that's not our subject. Can you see now an old man, and he's dressed in all the fine garments of the Jewish high priesthood. There he is with a great sagely authority in front of the judgment seat of Christ. And his judge says to him, well now, Caiaphas, what about this? I said to you, hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. What do you have to say for yourself? And Caiaphas, who had denied the reality of the Lord Jesus as that promised Messiah, says, well, I was afraid for what was going to happen, that the Romans would come and take away our place in our nation and the great temple that had been built to the honour and to the glory of God. Well, we were all doing your work. And he says, but you knew that the parables I was speaking to you spoke of me and you. It says at least that they knew he was speaking about them. Uh, that they knew that he was speaking about them, yes. And but you didn't turn and recognize me. When I said, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of God, you didn't apparently want to make the connection with the psalm you knew so well from Psalm 110 that my Lord will sit at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. And Caiaphas then will find that where he was the judge, he is the judged it seems, and rejected by the Lord. God does not forget either those who choose not to have anything to do with him, and neither does he forget those who seek him, who seek his mercy, who desire his love. And then perhaps 
there's another old man who comes up. And here is a man who spent his life desiring to know, wanting to know what God's purpose was, desiring for it to be fulfilled above everything else. He'd been extracted from his home country, taken from everything that he knew, all his expectations and his hopes, all gone by the by, of when he was just a young teenager, taken to a foreign land. And there determined that he would not defile himself with the ways of that nation, but to seek after God's ways. He's been asleep for thousands of years, just like Caiaphas has, woken up. And here he is standing before the Lord, and Jesus says to him, Daniel, O man greatly beloved, and the Lord Jesus knew that in all those prophecies that Daniel had recorded, there was the time now. Of those prophecies that spoke of the coming of the Messiah, of his death, of his resurrection, of the hope of salvation. Now he was Daniel in front of his Lord and his judge. And Daniel had been promised, wouldn't he, that at the end of the days he would enter into his lot, into his inheritance. Daniel is now going to go into the kingdom and he looks at his Lord and recognises as he bows before him, here is his saviour who has come to die for him. And now here is a woman, a woman who has loved her master, a woman who above everything else desired to be with her master, for he had freed her from a way of life which was pointless and vain and brought no satisfaction. A woman who had anointed his feet with her hair and with the tears that dropped from her, as well as the ointment. A woman who clung to him and now was to be united with him, never more to be separated from him. And the Lord knew her, Mary, as he knows us. He knows our hearts. He knows our desires, our desires to serve him. And sometimes how failingly. Because now the call is, well, now the call is, is you and me. And he calls our name. And we're set before him. And now everything else is gone, hasn't it? If, if the concerns before and the worries, if they had gone, well, now they've really gone. And now, as we stand before the judgment seat, there is only one thing that matters. There is only really one question that is on our minds. What has my life really been about? Has it been about serving myself or him? None of us could ever, none of those who appear before the Lord are going to be perfect. The Bible is full, isn't it, of people. It's not people who have no iniquity, but people who have recognised it. It's not people who have no sin, but people who have confessed it. It's not people who have no transgression, but people who have sought forgiveness for it. To have iniquity blotted out, to have washed our robes daily in the blood of the Lamb that we might be presented faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. The purpose of the judgment is not that we might feel without hope and without support. We are not intended to be going there in our own strength or in our own righteousness. We're going seeking God's mercy. We're going, if we're wise, clothed in the righteousness of the Son of God. And because... The bride made herself ready. You see what that revelation passage is saying to us. Every day now is our opportunity. We're, in the end, we're going to be reliant on his mercy, aren't we? We're going to desire his forgiveness, as we do now every day of our lives. But his desire is that we desire to be like the Lord Jesus, to be with him in the ages of eternity. So now just think, as the Lord has gathered all his people from all ages, those who've slept in the dust of the ground for thousands of years and those who've been alive at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the end will make no difference. Because we read this, don't we, in 1 Corinthians, 
I'm going to show you a mystery. I tell you a secret. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. But in a, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. I don't think here he's talking about the raising up from the ground of those who are asleep. He's talking about a change of nature, of ascending from mortal nature, from dying nature, to undying, immortal nature. And all the people of God, all of those whom the Lord has looked on and recognised and who has said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. All of those are going to be changed to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. To be made like him perfectly. The Lord doesn't want us to take that example of the, the man with the parable who to whom the Lord gave the pounds, or the talents, two parables, but the principles I think are the same, who said, well, you've given me this, but I can't do anything with it, so I put it in the ground. Oh, you knew, did you, said his Lord, that I was a hard man who gathered where I hadn't strawed. You knew, did you, that I had unreasonable expectations of you. You knew, did you, that I judged unfairly. I merely looked for you to look for me for strength each day. For mercy and forgiveness in your failings. To be clothed with my righteousness and to desire to do that which pleases me every day of your life. For here is my son whom I've given. Who died, who lived and died. That he might bring you to immortality. And here is all those people changed to be made like the Lord Jesus Christ. So just think then, what are those future blessings? Again the survey that I asked you to complete, brought out some really lovely ideas. To be free from disease, illness and death. That's the promise of the scriptures. That all the things that we wrestle with now have gone. All the daily worries and concerns, a thing of the past. No worries about our families. Being made a partaker of the divine nature as Peter expresses it. That just as the Lord Jesus Christ was changed, was raised in that nature, from that which we struggle with, flesh and blood, to be made like his Father in nature, that so we too might. And what that means, to be perfect, to be free from the battle with human nature. If ever we have tried to do the right thing and found ourselves doing the wrong thing, here is a wonderful promise. And the more we go on through life and the more we recognise the wonderful perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ and our desire to be like him and the recognition that we fail, the more beautiful that picture is. And God is looking for us not to be perfect now, but to desire that perfection, to desire his mercy and his forgiveness that he might make us like him to his glory. And then the people that we might meet. The Bible heroes, hearing their life stories, people like Peter and Daniel and Mary, meeting perhaps people who we have loved and who sleep in the dust of the ground, seeing perhaps our family in that wonderful kingdom. Can you imagine what it would be like to be able to go to David or Daniel and Peter and ask them, about their experiences, to ask that widow who put in all the living that she had, that her faith and her dependence on her God was that total, and that would be recorded and written in the gospel as we read it, and then to know God, to meet Jesus and be with him forever, that, that same loving Lord that we read of, who is so passionate about God's ways and about his love, his righteousness and his grace, that we might even see him. That we might be one with the Father and with the Son. That that original joining of relationship that there was in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve, that speaks of every human relationship being set at rights, and the oneness with our Creator, and with his Son, as it was in the Garden with the Father, that that might be our experience that we might give thanks for the grace that has been shown to us. Here's the Lord Jesus here, the perfect one. Here's us over here. God's grace, his free gift, 
is associating us with the death and the work of the Lord Jesus, that we might be brought to God through him. That we might be in fellowship with the Father's family. That we might see the King in his glory. You know, it says in Revelation that his servants shall serve him, for they shall see his face. To even see the face of God, which no mortal man, the scriptures say, can do. To understand the Father, not just in an academic sense, but to know him by being like him. In the absolute, in the ultimate. Able to do his will. To sing not just with our voices, but with our whole being. To praise him as totally and completely as our hearts beat and we breathe. And to live in a changed world. Perhaps to understand about what music there might be in the kingdom, what instruments there might be. And how music is in the scriptures always associated with worship. And all over the world, everywhere, there are going to be praises to God. And, and most of all, perhaps in the kingdom, in, in, sorry, within Jerusalem itself and within the temple worship. As year by year, the nations go up to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. And there's going to be a righteous execution of justice and judgment. Psalm 72 speaks very eloquently about how the poor and him that hath no helper will find right justice. It repeats the idea because that isn't how things naturally happen in our world. And there are going to have to be people to make sure that happens. We read in the Bible in Hebrews chapter 2 that God has not given the rulership of that age to angels hasn't given it to angels he's given it to people people who now have tried to serve him failingly but tried and them he's going to make rulers in that age and I wonder then if that's where some of our experiences now come into another perspective imagine being in the kingdom age when sin itself has been chained up not because the nature of the people in the kingdom has changed because they are still mortal, all the mortal population, the, the dying people who are still there, not the saints who have been made immortal, but the rest of the population who are there. But sin has been changed because the government and the media and all of those things are all changed to reflect the purpose of God. And you can really say sin is as bad as God says it is. You're not going to have people going around murdering without any effect. People aren't going to be robbing houses with no consequence. Those who are ruling that kingdom will know. And perhaps there will be children who will need to be trained and taught in godly ways. And there will be immortals on hand to look after them and to teach them and to show them the right way. So perhaps there's an experience you're having or you've had for which the Almighty has a purpose in the future. Animals and people at peace with one another, working in a team with others towards a common objective and the highest objective. Working with others towards a common goal is a great thing. What about the best goal of all? To change the world to be after the pattern of God's purpose. Until finally God's purpose is complete as his glory fills the earth. So as we come towards our end, you see, we have a choice. We could be like Felix when we think of all these things. When Felix, the Roman judge, came with his wife, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and he said, look, I can't take this. You're asking too much of me. I when it's more convenient. That's what he said. And we, we have that choice. Until the Lord comes, that's our choice. But we must think very carefully, mustn't we? Romans chapter 8. Let's just finish in Romans 8 and see how the Lord is giving to us a hope. Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ 
Jesus. That's where we want to be found, when the Lord comes. Like we read in Philippians chapter 3, that when he comes, I might be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, but that which is of faith in Christ. To be found truly in him and part of him. So that God, when, when God looks at us, he sees us as part of Christ. That's the picture. We don't want to be found outside of him on our own. With nothing but our own sins to condemn us. He wants us to be found as part of him. And this is the consequence in Romans 8, isn't it? We walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The manner of our life, the direction of our minds and our thinking and our hearts and our motivation is after God's ways. Not that we're sinless, but we're desiring with every fibre of our being to be more like the Lord Jesus. And so he says, as he goes on through this chapter, he speaks of the wonderful work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in him. Verse 28. For, and rather, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, the invited. And here is the call, here is the invitation we've been thinking about it tonight that's come out from the Bible, that God is saying to each of us, here's the call, the invitation to the marriage, not just to be guests, but to be part of the bride. Those who are to be united with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. Not just to live forever, but to be one with Christ and his Father forever. Remember what the Lord Jesus said, for this is life eternal. This is the very quality of eternal life. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And it would need an eternity to truly come to know God, wouldn't it? And so he goes on. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He, whom he did foreknow, he wanted to be made like the image of his Son. That's God's purpose, that all of us may be made like the Lord Jesus, ultimately. Ultimately like him in nature. So he says, verse 31, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He's, he sent his son to die for us. He wants us to take hold of his invitation and to be with him in the kingdom. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. It's God who's making righteous. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again. Who is sitting at God right, God's right hand, that we might come to God through him? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, affliction, difficulty, pressure, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Verse 38, verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's the hope. There's the assurance. If only we will trust in the work of the Lord Jesus and seek his ways. We have been invited. And you know that to an invitation, there are four little letters, aren't there, that appear at the end. Reponde, s'il vous plaît, I believe. Please reply. Please respond. Let us each think carefully, whatever our position, as we await the coming of the Lord and desire to be with him in the glories of that eternal age he has promised in his purpose.
BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.